Before we begin today's story, I want to let you know that we're going to be talking about the September 11th, 2001 attacks, including some of the audio from the cockpit of one of the hijacked planes. I almost didn't cover this story on purpose out of the respect for those involved. But then I was talking with a friend's son the other day when he said something that surprised me. He didn't know anything about the events of 9-11 that happened almost two decades ago now. Some of us have lived through that, and it's hard to imagine a new generation of people who don't know the story. It's disturbing content for sure, so if you'd rather not listen to this episode, I completely understand. But talking to him changed my perspective. I don't think we should hide from history. We should honor those lost and learn from our mistakes. I hope by telling this story, we'll all remember the events of that day and honor the memories of those we lost to such a horrible act of senseless violence. There are some days that you never forget. Some events that are so shocking, even if you weren't involved, where you were when it happened gets imprinted on your memory. When I woke up on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, I went to work as if it were any other day. But it wasn't any other day. Normally, I probably would have asked off for the entire day, but I worked as a sports editor at a daily newspaper, so I had to get that day's edition out before I could take off. As it was, I'd asked for the afternoon off and planned a birthday dinner for my wife at the time. We always kept the TV on at the newspaper. That day wasn't any different in that regard. Most days, the quiet droning of the reporters blended into the background hustle and bustle of keyboards clacking, papers shuffling, and or even the printing press itself, which was a few rooms away. I was in the middle of writing an article when we noticed something a little different on the TV. It was just after the first plane hit, and the scene was chaotic. Everyone in the newsroom left their desks and huddled around the small TV. No one said anything. Eyes were glued to the screen. Then, all of a sudden... Another airplane made its way onto the screen. What the? It just crashed into the other... What is going on? I don't remember what I wrote about that day. It probably wasn't anything worthwhile anyway. Covering sports didn't really seem that important then. That afternoon, I stuck to my plans. My now ex and I spent about an hour on the road that day as we drove to and from the restaurant across town. Our route took us past McConnell Air Force Base... As we drove by, there was a line of cars headed into the base that had to be at least five miles long. More cars kept getting added to the back end, but the line never seemed to move. Many years later, I'd work at a different Air Force base, and I heard stories from people who were sitting in those cars. Not those cars in particular. It was a different Air Force base, but they had to wait in the line themselves as the base immediately went on high alert while simultaneously calling in any off-duty airmen and women back to the base. There were no airplanes in the sky, though. It was a strange feeling. With everything that was going on, I don't even remember seeing anything about the other airplanes that crashed on TV before I left the office, but I remember hearing about it as we listened to the radio in the car on the way to dinner. I can hardly believe that was 17 years ago. It took many years before we started to get answers to those questions that were asked by the world that day. Even today, there's still plenty of unanswered questions. So in honor of those events that shook the world that Tuesday morning, today, we're going to look at one of the movies that dives into the story of the passengers who witnessed the terror firsthand. I'm Dan LeFebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before we begin our story today, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, which means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, United 93 was the only airplane hijacked on September 11th to have four hijackers. The others had five. Number two, United 93 was the only plane not to reach the destination the hijackers intended on September 11th. Number three, United 93 was the only plane from United Airlines to get hijacked on September 11th. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, you'll find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. 
And if you want the answers, hang out until the end of the episode, and we'll do a recap to see how well you did. Oh, and if you've got a moment, hop onto the Based on a True Story Facebook group and share your own story of where you were on September 11th, 2001. Until then, let's begin our story today as we compare history with the movie United 93. Before we see anything on screen, we hear something. It sounds like a prayer in Arabic. Then we see a book. Khalid Abdallah's character, Zia Jara, is holding the book. It's not a prayer. He's reading it. We can't tell what the book is, but the implication from the film, it's probably the Quran. The room isn't anything special that he's in. It looks like a hotel room. Another man enters. It's Omar Bodorini's character, Ahmed Al-Haznawi. It's time, Haznawi tells Jara. Then, after seeing the title of the movie, we see two other men. Jamie Harden's character, Ahmed Al-Nami, and Louis Al-Samari's character, Saeed Al-Gamdi. Along with Haznawi and Jarrah, the four men arrive at the Newark airport separately. Two groups of two. The specifics of all of that is made up for the movie. What is true from this opening sequence is the characters. The rest of it, we just don't know. It's not like the four men we see arriving at the airport documented what they said and did for us to find later. With that said, though, the investigators have been able to pull a few things about the four men after the fact. Let's start with Ziad Jura, who, at the time of the attacks, was 26 years old, and he was the oldest of the four. Jura was born in Lebanon to a wealthy family. At age 21, he studied at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences in Germany, It was around here that we believe he met others who would be involved in the September 11th attacks as they formed what investigators refer to as the Hamburg Cell. Somewhere around 1999, we believe Jarrah was recruited by Osama bin Laden for the attacks. In June of 2000, Jarrah arrived in the United States and began training at the Florida Flight Training Center. There, he learned how to pilot airplanes until January of 2001. On September 7th, 2001, Jarrah left Fort Lauderdale flying to Newark, where he stayed until the 11th. The next oldest at the time of the attacks was Ahmed Al-Nami. He was two years younger than Jarrah at 24 years old on September 11th, 2001. We don't know as much about Nami's early days. He was born in Saudi Arabia, and we know he went to Afghanistan to train in an Al-Qaeda camp. That's where we believe he met some of the others involved in the attacks. Thanks to documentation from his tourist visa, we know Nami arrived in the U.S. in May of 2001. He moved into the same apartment as Saeed Al-Gamdi in the Miami area, more specifically Delray Beach, Florida. The two lived there until paying cash for tickets on the same flight as Jarrah and Ahmed Al-Haznawi to New York. Speaking of Saeed Al-Gamdi, he was the next oldest of the group at age 21 on September 11th. Like Nami, he was born in Saudi Arabia. In November of 2000, Nami applied for a visa to enter the United States, but he was declined. He applied again in June of 2001, and this time he was approved for a two-year visa. Although some have debated the authenticity of this, still others believe that it was in August of 2001 that Gamdi sent this message to his girlfriend online. The first semester commences in three weeks. Two high schools and two universities. This summer will surely be hot. 19 certificates for private education and four exams. Regards to the professor. Goodbye. That girlfriend was not a girlfriend at all. Gamdi didn't have a girlfriend. But the message was sent to a man named Rami bin Al-Shib. He was someone who was a key figure in the planning of the attacks. And we all know what happened roughly three weeks later. The last of the four we haven't talked about yet is Ahmed Al-Haznawi. He was the youngest of the four on September 11th, which was exactly one month before his 21st birthday. We don't know a lot about his early years, but he likely was trained in Afghanistan in the late 1990s. Then in November of 2000, he was approved for a two-year visa to the United States. But he didn't arrive right away. He stayed in Saudi Arabia for Ramadan. It wasn't until June of 2001 that he arrived in Miami. He lived with Ziad Jarrah in an apartment in Fort Lauderdale, getting his driver's license in July of the same year. 
On September 11th, he filled out a change of address forms and was given another copy of the same license. Did he lose his license that quickly? We don't really know, but some theories suggest perhaps that's so multiple people could use the same license, basically the same identity. He arrived in Newark with Gerard on that same day, September 7th, on the same flight as the other three soon-to-be hijackers. With that brief history of the four hijackers of United Flight 93, let's hop back into the movie's timeline where the four men arrived for their flight from Newark to San Francisco. That was United Flight 93's original destination. In the airport, we see people lining up for the queue at the security station. The four men put their bags on the conveyor belt for an x-ray scan and walk through a metal detector. One of the men gets pulled aside to be scanned with a wand, but nothing goes off. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. Even though the movie doesn't share the timing of this, we get another clue into whether or not the four men arrived together or separately by the times they checked in. Saeed Al-Ghamdi was the first of the four to check in for his flight when he did so without any luggage at 7.03 a.m. Ahmed Al-Nami checked in at the same time as Ghamdi, but he checked two bags. At 7.24 a.m., Ahmed Al-Haznawi checked in with one bag and then Zia Jira checked in without any luggage at 7.39 a.m. Of the four, Haznawi was the only one to get randomly selected for extra security. His bag was checked, but nothing out of the ordinary was found. Now, if you've been to the airport recently, you might be wondering, how could they have gotten through so easily? No one had to take their shoes off, take off their belts or anything. How could the weapons they use or any weapons get through security? Seems like a valid question. The movie is correct in showing the ease with which you could get through airport security, though. In fact, it was because of the attacks on September 11th that many would call into question just how good airport security really was if all the hijackers were able to make it onto the plane with knives. At that time, though, you could board airplanes with small pocket knives. Those weren't considered that big of a deal. The same goes for ID, identification. While we talked briefly about some of the four men on United 93 getting driver's licenses, not all of the hijackers that day had proper ID. But all of the flights were domestic flights, so the requirement for proper ID was a bit more relaxed than with international flights. In fact, it used to be that you could walk right up to the gate without a ticket. Not to date myself, but I remember going to the airport with my family as a kid and greeting family members as their planes arrived straight out of the gate. Of course, you can't do any of that now. The requirements for ID has changed, and most of that was implemented in the wake of September 11th. Heading back to the movie, the next scene introduces us to the head of the National Air Traffic Control Center in Herndon, Virginia. It's Ben Sliney, and we see him entering the room to some clapping and a voice off screen saying, Congratulations on the promotion, Ben. As far as we can tell, the day seems to be starting off much like any other day. And that's true, with one important distinction. Yes, we see the clapping and congratulations on the promotion in the movie, but the film never really tells us what it's for. Well, after about 25 years of working his way up the chain in the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA as they're more commonly called, Ben Sliney was promoted to the position of National Operations Manager at the FAA. Basically, he was the man in charge at the National Air Traffic Control Center. So that clapping and congratulations the movie glosses over quickly was because of Ben Sliney's promotion to the position of National Operations Manager of the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. His first day on the job, September 11th, 2001. Oh, and the actor playing Ben Sliney? Ben Sliney. Yep, that's the real person playing himself in the movie, something the filmmakers did for a lot of the roles. Back in the movie, the boarding begins for United Flight 93. People are going about their normal pre-flight routines in the waiting area, calling family, reading the newspaper or a book. In the waiting area, we see Ziad Jara make a phone call before boarding. We don't know who it's to, but all we hear him say is, I love you. That's actually true. As Gerard was still checking in at 7.39 a.m., Hasnawi and Gamdi were boarding the airplane. They both sat in business class or first class with Hasnawi sitting in seat 6B while Gamdi was in 3D. At 7.40 a.m., Nami boarded. He was also in business class sitting in seat 1B. Eight minutes later, at 7.48 a.m., Gerard boarded the plane and took his seat, 3C, in business class. 
In a 2002 investigation into one of the conspirators of the plot, Jara's girlfriend, Isil Sengen, told investigators about her relationship with him. This took place during a trial in Germany where Isil was born. And yes, she was his real girlfriend. Jara was the only one of the hijackers on United 93 that day to actually have a girlfriend. Unlike some of the other hijackers, Jara actually had a plan for the future. He wanted to marry Isil, have kids, and become a commercial airline pilot. At least, that's what Isil believed, and that's what he said in the investigation. She said Jara called her the morning of September 11th. He didn't say much, but he kept repeating, I love you, three times. When she asked what was wrong, he hung up. Later, it would come to light that the call Jara made was from a public payphone in the airport, not from a cell phone like we saw in the movie. This little bit of information on Zia Jara shows him as being different from the other three hijackers aboard United 93. He seemed to be close to his family. The others had left their families behind, rarely communicating with them beforehand. He'd trained for this moment since his days as a part of the Hamburg cell in Germany, but as the hour drew closer, many have speculated that perhaps Jura was the only one of the four on board United 93 to have some hesitation about what he was about to do. As United 93 boards, the movie takes us to the Boston Air Traffic Control Center. One of the controllers focuses in on an American Flight 11, telling it to turn 20 degrees to the right. Then, we're back on United 93 briefly as the last passenger arrives and the plane starts to leave the gate. Bouncing back and forth, we shift back to Boston as American 11 didn't seem to respond to the order to turn 20 degrees to the right. American 11, Boston Center, do you read? No response. Another controller tries. American 11, this is Boston, do you read? Nothing. Then, all of a sudden, the controller hears static. Someone is saying something, but he can't quite make it out. Boston, say again, please. He tries to get American 11 to repeat whatever they said. There's no reply. The controller calls over his supervisor. He's sure he heard someone speaking a different language that wasn't the pilot. Immediately, he assumes this might be a hijack situation. Word is sent from Boston to Ben Sliney at the National Air Traffic Control Center. While we don't know the specifics of how quickly the controller jumped to the conclusion that this might be a hijacking situation, the basic gist of that is true. What the movie doesn't mention, though, is the timing of what's happening. American Airlines Flight 11 took off from Boston at 7.59 a.m. on that Tuesday morning. At around 8.14 a.m., just 15 minutes later, five hijackers forced themselves into the cockpit. We don't really know how many were injured initially, but... Most have estimated there were at least three people injured, maybe even one of them killed. Mohammed Atta, one of the ringleaders of the whole plan, took over the controls as pilot. About 10 minutes later, at 8.24, that's when one of the controllers at Boston overheard Atta speaking to the passengers on the plane. Just like the movie shows, he couldn't make out exactly what was said at first. It's the first communication from any of the hijackers and something that would later be turned into the first chapter, the title of the first chapter of the 9-11 Commission Report. We have some planes, was the title of the first chapter. What Ada said at 8.24 a.m. to the passengers on board American 11 was, quote, We have some planes. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are returning to the airport, end quote. At 8.25 a.m., just a minute later, Ada followed up that chilling first message with another warning. Quote, Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any moves, you'll endanger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. End quote. What the movie doesn't mention is that wasn't the only communication with American 11. The FAA wasn't made aware of this as quickly as the communication they heard from Ada immediately, but about five minutes after the hijackers took over American 11, two of the flight attendants, Betty Ong and Madeline Sweeney, called American Airlines' operation center from one of the air phones. We'll learn more about Madeline's call later, but Betty's call started at about 8.19 a.m., and for 25 minutes, she stayed on the line, giving us most of what we know about the hijacking on American 11. The cockpit isn't answering the phone. There's somebody stabbed in business class. They can't breathe in business class, Betty described. They've got mace or something. I don't know, but I think we're getting hijacked. Then she continued saying, Our first class galley attendant and our purser are stabbed. We can't get into the cockpit. The door won't open. Many have speculated that the passengers aboard American 11 believe the hijackers were taking them back to the airport. 
After all, that's what Ada said in his communication. It must be a ransom they're wanting. So they'll go back to the airport and everything will be over soon. Others have suggested, based on Betty's call, that perhaps some of the passengers on American 11 thought there was a medical emergency in business class, but that they didn't really know what else was going on. Back in the movie, as they're trying to figure out if it's a hijacking or not, there's a mention of code 7500. Did American 11 issue a code 7500? No, they didn't. So do we really know if this is the hijacking? Now, the movie doesn't specifically mention what code 7500 is, but the implication is that it has something to do with hijacking. And that's true. They're what pilots refer to as guac codes because it's something that the original use of the codes during World War II was through a system codenamed Parrot, so it got the nickname Squawk Codes. There's thousands of Squawk Codes from 000 to 777. They're all four-digit codes. But there's three that every pilot knows by heart. 7500 means hijacking, 7600 means radio emergency, and 7700 means an emergency. Looking at American 11 through history, the movie is correct in stating that they never issued a 7500 hijacking code. We don't really know why, but the speculation has been that the hijackers took over the cockpit so fast that the pilots didn't have a chance to. Back in the movie, news of American 11's possible hijacking starts to spread from the Boston Air Traffic Control Center to the National Air Traffic Control Center, and finally to the military side, the Northeast Air Defense Command Center, or NEEDS. Even without confirmation, the military takes action. Greg Henry's character, Colonel Robert Marr, is in charge at the command center and orders Otis called to put the airplanes on alert. That's true. Now, there's been some discrepancy with the exact time here because Colonel Marr himself first stated in 2003 for the 9-11 Commission that he gave the scramble order around 8.36 a.m. But then others have questioned that timing since the news first made it to needs at 8.36 a.m. So a more commonly accepted timing is that it was 841 when Colonel Marr ordered fighters at Otis Air Force Base near Falmouth, Massachusetts to scramble. Today, actually, Otis is known as the Otis Air National Guard Base since it was transferred from the Air Force when it was Otis Air Force Base and to the Air National Guard. So now it's Otis Air National Guard Base. Meanwhile, back in the movie, United 93 is cleared for takeoff. The movie doesn't show us times at all, but United 93 took off at 842 a.m. It was supposed to take off at 8 o'clock a.m., but it was postponed due to something we're all familiar with when flying, congestion. The airport was busy, so even though the plane pushed back from the gate at about 8 o'clock, it didn't actually take off until 8.42. In the movie, we see the New York Air Traffic Control Center tracking American 11. The transponder was turned off, so they're trying to get other airplanes to help them find it. One of those planes is United 175. They're trying to get it to respond, American 11, when the tracker just disappears from the screen. What do you mean, it disappeared? One of the controllers asked. It disappeared right around Manhattan, comes the reply. It just disappeared. The movie sends us back to the needs as they're asking if the Otis birds are in the air yet. Then, back in New York, we're in a control tower when they see a bunch of smoke in the distance. Wait, what's that? There's smoke coming out of the Trade Center. Back in the Federal Air Control Center, they hear about the smoke and turn on CNN. There's a report on screen that a small airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. Ben Sliney immediately starts to connect the dots. Look at the size of that hole. That's not a small airplane. And we lost American 11 over the city? This isn't good. All of that is true. At 8.42 a.m., United 175 reached out to the FAA with what would turn out to be one of their own final transmissions. They were responding to the FAA's call for any information on American 11. United Airlines 175. New York, UAL 175, heavy. FAA. UAL 175, go ahead. United Airlines 175. Yeah, we figured we'd wait to go to your center... Uh, We heard a suspicious transmission on our departure out of Boston. Uh, Someone with, uh, it sounded like someone keyed the mics and said, uh, everyone uh, stay in your seats. FAA. Oh, okay. I'll pass that along over here. Do you remember earlier when we learned about the phone call that one of the flight attendants on American 11 made? 
That was Betty Ong, and she relayed that the flight was hijacked as early as 8.19 a.m. Well, we also learned that Betty wasn't the only one to make a call from American 11. At 8.44 a.m., another flight attendant named Madeline Sweeney made a call to the flight services department at American Airlines. She reported the stabbings that Betty had reported earlier and confirmed again the plane was hijacked. She also mentioned that the plane seemed to have been rerouted from its original flight path. Now, American 11 was a flight from Boston to Los Angeles, so to make their way to New York City, the plane went further south than they had planned. On her phone call, Madeline explained, Something is wrong. We are in a rapid descent. We are all over the place. The person on the other end of the line asked her if she could look out the window to identify where there were. I see water. I see buildings. We're flying low. We're flying very, very low. We're flying way too low. Oh my God, we're flying way too low. Oh my God. That's the last communication we got from American Airlines Flight 11. At 8.46 a.m., it crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, killing everyone. Meanwhile, 153 miles away, at that exact moment, the first of two F-15 fighters took off from Otis in response, heading toward New York City to intercept the hijacked plane. The second followed moments afterward. But there was a problem. The F-15s didn't know exactly where they were going. They needed more of a precise location of the airplane to be able to intercept it. This statement from the official 9-11 Commission report gives us insight into the confusion. F-15 fighters were scrambled at 8.46 from Otis Air Force Base, but Needs did not know where to send the alert fighter aircraft, and the officer directing the fighters pressed for more information. Quote, I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination, end quote. Because the hijackers had turned off the plane's transponder, Needs personnel spent the next minutes searching their radar scopes for the primary radar return. American 11 struck the North Tower at 8.46. Shortly after 8.50, while Needs personnel were still trying to locate the flight, word reached them that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. Radar data showed the Otis fighters were airborne at 8.53. Lacking a target, they were vectored toward military-controlled airspace off the Long Island coast. To avoid New York area air traffic and uncertain about what to do, the fighters were brought down to military airspace to, quote, hold as needed, end quote. From 9.09 to 9.13, the Otis fighters stayed in this holding pattern. In summary, Needs received notice of the hijacking nine minutes before it struck the North Tower. That nine minutes notice before impact was the most the military would receive of any of the four hijackings. Oh, and yes, it is true that CNN first reported a small airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. This came from some of the first eyewitness reports that CNN managed to scrape together just a few minutes after the impact. Some people thought it looked like a small propeller plane that hit the Trade Center. Another report suggested maybe it wasn't a propeller plane, but a small passenger jet, maybe a 737. In truth, American 11 was a Boeing 767-223ER. Clearly, not a small airplane. Back in the movie, United 93 has reached its cruising altitude. Meanwhile, at the FAA, Ben Sliney is trying to make sense of what he just saw on CNN when the camera cuts to New York's air traffic controllers. They're looking for United 175, which has also gone off the radar when one of the guys spots it in the sky. He points. There it is. Wait, it's flying right toward the smoke. Why is it flying so low? Then they're just done silence. That's true. Do you remember that communication from United 175 about American 11? That was at 8.42. Four minutes later, American 11 crashed into the North Tower. We don't know the exact timing, but right about that time, the five hijackers on board did the exact same thing that they did on American 11. They did that to United 175. They forced their way into the cockpit, overpowered the pilot, and took over the controls with one of their own becoming the new pilot. Less than a minute after American 11 hit the North Tower, United 175's transponder code changed as it started to change direction towards New York City. That wasn't noticed, though, 
because at the New York Control Center, the same controller happened to be assigned to both American 11 and United 175. Since he knew American 11 was hijacked, that was the focus. He simply didn't notice the transponder code changes for United 175 until about 8.51. At that point, they tried to reach out to United 175. There was no response. After repeated attempts to contact United 175 failed, at 8.53, the controller started to raise the alarm that there might be another hijacking. At 9 o'clock a.m., one of the passengers on United 175 made a phone call to his dad. It's getting bad, Dad. A stewardess was stabbed. They seem to have knives and mace. They said they have a bomb. Passengers are throwing up and getting sick. The plane is making jerky movements. I, I don't think the pilot is flying the plane. I think we're going down. I think they intend to go to Chicago or something and fly into a building. Don't worry, Dad. If it happens, it'll be very fast. My God. My God. The call got cut off. At 9.02 a.m., United 93 reached its cruising altitude, just like the movie shows. One minute later, at 9.03 a.m., United 175 crashed into the South Tower, the World Trade Center. Because of the crash from American 11 that had hit the North Tower 17 minutes earlier, there were several cameras facing the World Trade Center. That's why we have so much footage of the second plane hitting the South Tower. As a little side note, some of the only known footage of the initial impact of the first plane into the North Tower came from a documentary filmmaker named Jules Naudet. He was filming a story on New York firefighters. In the footage, we can see a firefighter on screen. There's the sound of a plane overhead that catches his attention, causing the firefighter to look up. Then he looks back down, but the camera does the same and manages to find the plane in the sky just in time to see it hit the tower and burst into flame. Back in the movie, we're back on board United 93 as the hijackers start to get antsy. Ahmed Al-Nami gets up and goes to the restroom. When he comes back, he stops by Ziad Jarrah. We have to do this now, he says. But Jarrah orders him back to his seat. I'll let you know when the time is right, he says. Right now, it's a good time to point out something about the movie. While we didn't see inside the airplane for American 11 or United 175, we do get to see inside United 93. But the truth is, we don't really know what happened on United 93. Sure, there's a flight recorder. The full audio recording has never been publicly released, even though we have transcripts. But there's a lot you can't tell from transcripts. There's a lot you can't tell from audio, especially since the movie was released on April 28th. 2006. It was only 16 days before the movie's public release that the government released the transcripts from the cockpit voice recording. So the filmmakers didn't have that to work from. Although they did have access to many of the victims' loved ones who had been granted access by the government to listen to the recording. And sadly, as I'm sure you already know, it's not like we have any eyewitnesses to tell the tale. So Everything we see in the movie happening on board United 93 after it left the gate in Newark is really nothing more than an educated guess at how things might have gone. For example, in the movie, we see a message come through to the pilots. We see the two pilots, Captain Jason Dahl and First Officer Leroy Homer, read the message. The message says, quote, your wife called, wanted to make sure you're OK, end quote. If you pause the movie on screen, you'll get more information. The contact on the screen says it's Ed Ballinger from United Airlines. The time is 922. The movie doesn't really mention what the messaging system is called, but we know it's the Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System, or ACARS. We also know that message was sent through ACARS. What we don't know that the movie shows is how Leroy reacted to it. It makes sense to have it be something like what we saw in the movie, shrugging it off, but we just don't know. We see another message come through in the movie. This time, the message says, quote, Beware any cockpit intrusion. 2AC, or aircraft, hit World Trade Center, end quote. As the movie shows, this message must have caused some surprise. Is that true? What sort of aircraft? What does that have to do with a cockpit intrusion? There's a lot of questions there. So in the movie, we see Captain Dahl ask for confirmation. And that's true. One thing that American Airlines never did was to send any cockpit warnings through ACARS to their pilots. United, on the other hand, did. 
it wasn't something they ordered across the board to all United Airlines, but rather it was something that a single person, flight dispatcher Ed Bellinger, took on himself to do. He took the initiative to transmit the message we saw to 16 different flights. One of them was, as the movie shows, United 93. Although the timing is a little off from what we saw in the movie. According to the official 9-11 Commission report, Ed started transmitting his warning message at 919. The one that got transmitted to United 93, remember, he transmitted to 16 different flights. So the one that got transmitted to United 93 happened at 923, not 922 like the movie shows. And it was actually received in the cockpit at 924. But hey, that's pretty close. At 9.26 a.m., Captain Jason Dahl responded to Ed's message asking for confirmation, just like the movie shows. His message simply said, quote, Ed, confirm latest message, please. Jason, end quote. Two minutes later, the hijackers attacked. Before we see this happen, though, let's hop back into the movie because there's an important plot point that gets mentioned. Two, actually. The first happens when we see conversations at needs. One of the guys briefly mentions they've lost another airplane, American 77, out of Dulles. This is a minor mention here in the movie, but it's also true. American Airlines Flight 77 was one of the four planes hijacked on September 11th. The movie doesn't really focus much on this one, which is why we haven't really talked about it much in this episode yet. But to learn more, a little more about that flight, we'll have to go back in time a little bit to 8.10 a.m., That's when Flight 77 was scheduled to take off from Washington Dulles Airport bound for Los Angeles. It was a Boeing 757 with 58 passengers on board. Due to the congestion at the airport, it ended up leaving a little bit late at 8.20 a.m. By the time 8.46 a.m. rolled around, it had reached cruising altitude. The last normal communication with American 77 was at 8.51 a.m. We don't know exactly when the hijacking began, but investigators estimate it was somewhere between 8.51 a.m. and 8.54. That estimate came because of the communication at 8.51, indicating everything was all right, no more communication. And then at 8.54, the airplane started to deviate from its flight path, heading south. There were some phone calls from the flight, which helped investigators afterward piece together some of the clues. There were five hijackers that passengers reported from their calls to have knives or box cutters. The passengers were forced to the rear of the airplane, and, like many of the others, passengers mentioned the hijackers saying that they had a bomb and were using mace. At 8.56 a.m., the hijackers' transponder was turned off and air traffic control lost it on the radar. Four minutes later, Gerard R.P., the executive vice president of American Airlines, found out about the situation with American 77, And after already knowing about American 11, he made the call to stop all American flights in the northeast region of the United States. Basically, if an American Airlines flight is on the ground, it's staying there. That was about three minutes before United 175 hit the South Tower. When that happened, at first, they thought it might be American 77. But then American Airlines found out that United was missing an airplane too. That's the aircraft that hit the South Tower, not American 77. So, RP made the call to expand the grounding of all American flights across the nation. At 9.29 a.m., one minute after Captain Dahl on United 93 asked for confirmation of the message he saw about the two aircraft hitting the Trade Center, American 77's autopilot was disengaged by the hijacker and it started to descend at high rate of speed, about 38 miles west of the Pentagon. Back in the movie, we see the hijackers begin their attack on United 93. This happens when Saeed Al-Ghamdi walks up to one of the flight attendants. Putting a knife to her throat, he yells, Allah Akbar. Back in the business class, Hasnawi pulls out a knife. Echoing Ghamdi's words, he stabs the guy in front of him. Blood starts pouring out and chaos ensues. We didn't really talk about this before, but earlier in the movie, we saw Hasnawi go into the bathroom and put together a bomb made out of wires, clay, and a battery. That doesn't sound like a real bomb to you. It's because, at least according to the movie, it's not. It's a fake, but it's enough to scare the passengers into not trying to fight back. And the truth is, we just don't know. We've already learned about multiple reports of people calling from the other airplane saying that the hijackers had a bomb, or at least they said they had a bomb. Was the bomb real? That part we don't really know for sure. It seemed across the board the hijackers were just trying to do whatever they could to try to buy time while they piloted the planes to their doom. To get a better idea of what we do know about how all this began, 
Here's the relevant section from the official 9-11 Commission report. The hijackers attacked at 928. While traveling 35,000 feet above eastern Ohio, United 93 suddenly dropped 700 feet. 11 seconds into the descent, the FAA's Air Traffic Control Center in Cleveland received the first of two radio transmissions from the aircraft. During their first broadcast, the captain or first officer could be heard declaring mayday amid the sounds of a physical struggle in the cockpit. The second radio transmission, 35 seconds later, indicated that the flight was continuing. The captain or first officer could be heard shouting, Hey, get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! One thing we don't know is why the hijackers on United 93 waited for so long. On American 11, the hijackers waited just 15 minutes before taking over the cockpit. On United 175, about 30 minutes. American 77 was hijacked in less than 35 minutes. As for United 93... For some reason, it took 46 minutes for the hijackers to begin their assault. We don't know why. And according to the official report coming out of the investigation, there's nothing to indicate the flight was anything but normal in those first 46 minutes. At 9.28 a.m., First Officer Leroy Homer was heard by ground control screaming, Mayday! Mayday! Here's the actual recording of that call. Cleveland's air traffic control was nearby and tried to reply. Somebody call Cleveland? Nothing. Then, 33 seconds later, Leroy's voice came across the radio again. This time, he was screaming both, Mayday and, Get out of here! Get out of here! United 93 dropped 685 feet as the pilots were attacked and before Ziad Jira took control of the plane. Back in the movie, we see the four hijackers take control of the cockpit fairly quickly. When they do, they kill both pilots, Captain Jason Dahl and Leroy Homer. Then they capture one of the flight attendants and keep her in the cockpit for a short period of time. Unfortunately, we don't know the fates of Captain Dahl and First Officer Homer, However, it's not likely that they were killed right away like the movie shows because their voices were heard on the cockpit voice recorder. Instead, investigators assume Leroy was knocked unconscious and removed from the cockpit while Captain Dahl was injured but stayed in the cockpit with Jura. We know this because he could be heard in the background moaning on the cockpit's voice recorder. It seemed that while being injured, even though he was injured, Jason was trying to mess with the controls to stop Jura. Each time, Jura would say something to Jason in English, then talk to the other hijackers in Arabic. One thing Captain Dahl did before he was injured, though, was crucial. He switched the microphones for the pilots to transmit to the radio. So when the pilots thought they were transmitting to the passengers in the cabin, they were actually talking to air traffic control. At 9.31 a.m., Ziad Jura made this announcement to the passengers. It was picked up by air traffic control. Now, I'll admit that recording is a bit hard to understand. According to the 9-11 Commission, this is what Jira was saying. Ladies and gentlemen, hear the captain. Please sit down. Keep remaining seating. We have a bomb on board. So, sit. Now that you know what he's saying, here's the recording one more time. Back in the movie, we're at needs as the military is trying to figure out why the fighters aren't in the right place. Then they see something on one of their screens. CNN is reporting smoke at the Pentagon. There's stunned silence. The movie doesn't mention timing, but that report was coming just minutes after American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. Back on board United 93, two minutes after American 77 crashed into the Pentagon, Ziad Jura made one more announcement to the passengers. And again, that's tough to know what he's saying, so here's the transcript given by the 9-11 Commission later. 
Here's the captain. I would like to tell you all to remain seated. We have a bomb aboard, and we are going back to the airport, and we have our demands. So please remain quiet. Knowing what he's saying, maybe you can make it out better the second time. So here's Jira's announcement one last time. Back in the movie, after American 77 crashed into the Pentagon, we see Ben Sliney react to it by doing something unprecedented. He issued an order to land every single plane, nothing in the air. According to the movie, that's the process of landing over 4,200 planes as soon as possible, no matter the destination. And that's true. Remember, this was Ben Sliney's first day on the job. At 9.42 a.m., the FAA command center learned about the crash at the Pentagon. That's when Ben Sliney made the order to land every plane. Although, it's worth pointing out that some other people have made the claim that they're the one to make the call. People like Richard Clark, the National Security Council's anti-terrorism director, and Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta. And they might have made similar decisions around the same time, but it was Ben Sliney's order that was the one to make it happen. According to the official 9-11 report, there were somewhere around 4,500 planes in the air at the time. Landing them is no small task by any means. And despite the tall order, every one of those planes landed without incident. In the movie, as we're on United 93, the passengers initially seem to think if they go along with the hijackers, they'll go back to the airport. A ransom will be demanded, and it'll be a horrifying experience, but no one expects to die. Do what you're told, and you'll survive. Then, a man named Thomas Burnett calls his wife. That's when the passengers first hear about the other attacks. His wife mentions the two planes that hit the Trade Center. Then more passengers are on the plane, and they find out about the Pentagon. That's when the passengers start to realize they might not be able to get out of this alive if they sit back and do what they're told. Maybe the only way to survive is to take action. Thomas Burnett is played by Christian Clemenson in the movie, by the way. That's true, although the movie's timeline is a little off. The first call from Tom Burnett to his wife happened at 9.30 a.m. That's seven minutes before the Pentagon was struck and about a minute after Jarrah's first announcement to the passengers. Tom relayed information to his wife about what was happening, that a passenger had been stabbed and that he thought the bomb the hijackers claimed to have was a fake. When Tom's wife told him about the attack on the World Trade Center, he said he noticed the hijackers, quote, talking about crashing this plane. Oh my God, it's a suicide mission, end quote. During his last call with his wife, Tom said, don't worry, we're going to do something. In the movie, we see more calls from passengers. Hi mom, it's me. I'm on the airplane and it's been hijacked. I'm just calling to tell you I love you and goodbye. The heartbreaking kind of call. This is true. In all, 26 phone calls were made from the air phones on United 93. We don't know how many were made from mobile phones. Most of these calls were either to emergency services of some sort, to loved ones, or to leave a message on an answering machine one last time. Some have speculated that if the hijackers hadn't taken so long to take over the plane in the first place, perhaps those phone calls would have happened sooner, before or during the other attacks, meaning those calls might not have warned the passengers about the attacks, and United 93's fate might have been very different. In the movie, we see how the passengers organize their fight back. Just before beginning their attack on the hijackers, we see David Allen Bash's version of Todd Beamer whisper, quote, You guys, what are we waiting for? Come on, let's roll. Come on, let's go already. End quote. Todd Beamer was a real passenger on United 93, and the phrase, let's roll, is something that has turned into sort of a rallying cry for those wanting to honor the memories of those who lost their lives. Although that brief phrase is something Todd really said, it didn't happen like we saw in the movie. You see, it happened when Todd placed his own call on the earphone. He didn't want to call his wife and make her worried, so instead he chose to call the GTE Verizon switchboard. The agent who answered was soon overwhelmed with the call, and it was passed to a supervisor named Lisa Jefferson. They talked back and forth for a while, with Todd letting Lisa know what they planned on doing. 
The passengers, along with some of the crew, were planning on jumping on the hijackers and either regaining control of the airplane or flying it into the ground so they couldn't finish their mission. Todd told Lisa, If I don't make it, please call my family and let them know how much I love them. Then Todd told Lisa about his family. He had two boys. His wife was pregnant. Then he said, Oh, God. After a brief moment, he said, Lisa, On the other end of the line, Lisa perked up at this. You see, she had never told Todd her first name. She introduced herself as Mrs. Jefferson, but she replied to Lisa, of course, that's her name, so she said, yes? Todd paused for a moment. Oh, that's my wife's name. Oh, it's my name too, Todd, Lisa told him. Then Todd asked Lisa to again call his family in case he didn't make it. She agreed. In the background, she could hear some muffled voices of the other passengers or crew. Then Todd's voice replied to whatever they said. Are you ready? Okay, let's roll. Those are the last words Todd Beamer said to Lisa Jefferson. Todd's own wife, also named Lisa, would later write a book called Let's Roll, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Courage. That's all about Todd's life and her dealing, Lisa dealing with the grief after the events on September 11th. Oh, and if you'll notice from what we've learned so far, all the other aircraft hijacked on September 11th had five hijackers. United 93 had four. According to the official 9-11 Commission report, the operative likely intended to round out the team for this flight, Mohammed Al-Khatani, had been refused entry by a suspicious immigration inspector at Florida's Orlando International Airport in August. So that's why United 93 had four hijackers compared to the three other planes with five each. It's also worth pointing out that many of the passengers who phoned from United 93 mentioned only three hijackers. Investigators assumed that's because Ziad Jara, the pilot, probably stayed in the cockpit the whole time. So the passengers only noticed three, even if there was a fourth. Going back to the movie, after the passengers begin their attack, The plane starts rocking from side to side. Ziad Jara is doing this in an attempt to stop the passengers from breaking into the cockpit. But they do. They overwhelm the hijackers, break into the cockpit, and manage to overwhelm Jara. As they start fighting for control of the yoke, Jara yells, Allah Akbar, one more time. There's a vicious fight. We can see the controls that the plane indicate it's starting to roll upside down. Outside the window, there's a green field. It gets closer. And closer. Then, black. Silence. As I mentioned before, a lot of what actually happened on United 93 is left open for speculation. We don't really know for sure. We're left trying to piece together the puzzle from the clues we do have, like Lisa Jefferson's conversation with Todd Beamer. Here's the official account of what happened from the 9-11 Commission report. At 9.57, the passenger assault began. Several passengers had terminated phone calls with loved ones in order to join the revolt. One of the callers ended her message as follows, quote, Everyone's running up to first class. I've got to go. Bye. End quote. The cockpit voice recorder captured the sounds of the passenger assault muffled by the intervening cockpit door. Some family members who listened to the recording report that they can hear the voice of a loved one among the din. We cannot identify whose voices can be heard but the assault was sustained. In response, Jara immediately began to roll the airplane to the left and right, attempting to knock the passengers off balance. At 9.58 and 57 seconds, Jara told another hijacker in the cockpit to block the door. Jara continued to roll the airplane sharply left and right, but the assault continued. At 9.59 and 52 seconds, Jara changed tactics and pitched the nose of the airplane up and down to disrupt the assault. The recorder captured the sounds of loud thumps, crashes, shouts, and breaking glasses and plates. At 10 o'clock and 3 seconds, Jara stabilized the airplane. Five seconds later, Jara asked, Is that it? Shall we finish it off? Another hijacker responded, No, not yet. When they all come, We finish it off. The sounds of fighting continued outside the cockpit. Again, Jara pitched the nose of the aircraft up and down. 
At 10 o'clock and 26 seconds, a passenger in the background said, In the cockpit, if we don't, we all die. 16 seconds later, a passenger yelled, Roll it. Jira stopped the violent maneuvers at about 10.01 and said, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He then asked another hijacker in the cockpit, Is that it? I mean, shall we put it down? To which the other replied, Yes, put it in it and pull it down. The passengers continued their assault, and at 10.02 and 23 seconds, a hijacker said, Pull it down, pull it down. The hijackers remained at the controls, but must have judged that the passengers were only seconds from overwhelming them. The airplane headed down. The control wheel was turned hard to the right. The airplane rolled onto its back, and one of the hijackers began shouting, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. With the sounds of the passenger counterattack continuing, the aircraft plowed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, at 580 miles per hour, about 20 minutes flying time from Washington, D.C. Dura's objective was to crash his airliner into symbols of the American Republic, the Capitol, or the White House. He was defeated by the alerted, unarmed passengers of United 93. That speed of 580 miles per hour, by the way, is about 933 kilometers per hour. There were two men who happened to be near the field and saw the airplane. One of them, Eric Peterson, described what he saw in a news report. When the plane came through here, I could see the wingtips were vertical. I could see the roof of the plane and the tops of the wings, he said. Then, gesturing to the location of the crash site, he continued, It was going upside down. And all at once, it made a 45-degree angle and it went right down where that big tree is, right where my finger is pointing. In the end, there were four planes hijacked that September morning. American Airlines Flight 11 was the first to crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, taking with it the lives of all 92 people on board. That's 76 passengers, 11 crew members, and five hijackers. An estimated 1,600 other people were killed in the World Trade Center, and the rescue workers trying to help. United Airlines Flight 175 was the second to crash into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Everyone on board died. That would be 65 people total, or 51 passengers, 9 crew, and 5 hijackers. Another 900 or so people, including rescue workers, were estimated to be killed in the South Tower. There's a total of 189 fatalities that were associated with American Airlines Flight 77 when it crashed into the Pentagon. That's including the 64 people on the plane, made up of 53 passengers, 6 crew, and 5 hijackers. Another 125 people in the Pentagon were killed. Thanks to the heroics of the people on board United 93, their airplane caused the least fatalities. Unfortunately, though, those heroics cost all 44 people on board their lives. That's 33 passengers, 7 crew members, and 4 hijackers. One of those crew members we learned about was Captain Jason Dahl. He was the pilot of United 93. He never got to talk to his wife, Sandy, before he was killed, but if he did, I'm sure it'd be filled with many of the same sentiments as those who did call loved ones. A lot of, I love you, and goodbye. But I'd like to think there might have been something else in there. Maybe something about their fifth wedding anniversary on September 13th. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. There's a lot of great resources out there to learn more about the events that took place on September 11th. If you're looking for somewhere to start, though, I would recommend reading the official 9-11 Commission report. That's the report that the government ordered to investigate everything and figure out what happened. And that's really where a lot of the security changes and things like that that we're familiar with now when we go to the airport, a lot of that came out of the report as they tried to piece together the things that happen. It's available for free online, and I'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, 
United 93 was the only airplane hijacked on September 11th to have forge hijackers. The others had five. Number two, United 93 was the only plane not to reach the destination the hijackers intended on September 11th. Number three, United 93 was the only plane from United Airlines to get hijacked on September 11th. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number three. As we learned, there were a total of four planes hijacked. Two of them were from American Airlines and two of them were from United Airlines. And so our story today comes to an end. If you're listening to this, I'd love to hear what your story is for September 11th, 2001. You heard mine at the beginning of this episode, but where were you when you heard the news? You can let me know in the Based on a True Story Facebook group or reaching out to me on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefebvre. That's D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.